listeners welcome to itihasa a indic history podcast and you're listening to episode 48 of the season vijayanagara this will be a continuation of the vijayanagara gajapati war mini series and we'll be taking a slight detour to look closely at the tulva dynasty and the rise of krishna devaraya in the next few episodes let us do a quick recap of the ending of the last episode before we continue with the story ahead in 1506 ce before embarking on expeditions to suppress the rebels veera narsimha raya had the last salwa namesake ruler imaradi narsimha silently assassinated and with that act of regicide the second royal dynasty of vijayanagara the salwas comes to an end after a short and quick rise and this officially inaugurated the birth of the third royal dynasty the tuluvas on the lion throne of vijayanagara yet again the fortunes of vijayanagara weren't all too rosy in 1506 ce the tulva dynasty was also challenged by the splinter kingdoms of the bahmani sultanate that had collapsed by then these splinter kingdoms had collectively marched on vijayanagara sometime at the end or for after 1506 ce to subdue it once and for all but vijayanagara somehow prevails against all of them in a single campaign under veera narsimha raya with this we end the quick recap now let us continue it from here towards the close of his reign about 1508 ce veera narsimha appears to have dispatched an army under his step brother krishna devaraya on the chiefs of ummattur and srirangapatnam and the prince krishna raya fought some victorious battles though the chiefs remain yet to be reduced to obedience in 1509 ce veera narsimha raya fell ill and died followed by the prince krishna devaraya on the throne whose inscriptions begin to appear from the ear Krishna Devaraya's period of rule constitutes the glorious epoch in the history of Vijayanagara empire with back to back military victories scored on all sides in quick succession besides being the apex time in the history of arts and culture in south india the name krishna devaraya even till this day evokes the same response in the hearts and minds of millions of south indians as much as it did in the 16th century vijayanagara people loved him then and they love him now great figures like chhatrapati shivaji maharaj maharana pratap and krishna devaraya are some of the few rulers in indian history who are adored and loved by millions of indians these courageous and charismatic figures are adored and respected by every proud hindu across the world for everything that they did to uphold dharma and protect the sacred land and civilization which we call as bharat in light of that a mere cursory account of the rise of shri krishna devaraya wouldn't do justice to either the podcast this episode or even to this great legend in the battle of raichur mini series we explored in depth the daring military exploits of krishna devaraya in his raichur campaign and the aftermath of it in this episode we shall look at his beginnings and rise to the lion throne of vijayanagara first let us start with his father narasanayaka whom we had seen earlier in the previous episodes narasa had at least 3 wives by each of whom had four children the first of these was tippamba by whom he had a son named veena narasimharaya by his second wife of nagala devi He had a son named Krishna Devaraya, who became afterwards the greatest of his dynasty. In by his third wife, O Bambika, he had two sons, Achyutraya and Ranga. These four sons are well known from the epigraphs and inscriptions of the period. The famous Portuguese traveler Fernão Nunes too confirms this, though he confuses the son of Ranga to be the son of Narasanayaka. and ends up thinking that he has five sons instead an extraordinary story is told by kumara durjati a telugu poet who lived at the court of chinnavenkata of the aravedu dynasty 
about a hundred years after Krishna Deva Raya's time. He talks about an attempt made by Narasanayaka at the behest of his first queen, Tipamba, to assassinate Krishna Deva Raya while he was a young boy. The tale is set out in some detail in Durjati's well-known poem, Krishna Raya Vijayam, sometimes also called Krishna Raya Charitra, a name by which it is referred to in the Mackenzie archives too. According to this poet Durjati, Krishna Deva Raya was a son of Narasa by Nagamamba Devi or also known as Nagala Devi, a friend and attendant of the principal queen Tipamba. Narasa supposedly took interest in Nagala Devi and later took her as his wife. Queen Tipamba would have obviously been both jealous and insulted at this promotion of her attendant as her husband's second wife. and as a result a legitimate competition for her own offspring after nagala devi gives birth to krishna deva raya sometime around 1484 or 1487 ce and he starts growing up into a fine boy the pamba starts growing even more jealous of krishna deva raya and is supposed superiority over her son veera narsimha and she prevails on her husband narsanayaka to order krishna deva raya to be put to death the officer to whom this duty was entrusted being reluctant to fulfill it informed the chief minister who undertook a secret mission to hide the young prince krishna raya till he could be brought out safely after hiding him the chief minister lies to the king stating that his command had been obeyed and that the young prince was assassinated secretly as per durjati the king on his deathbed was terribly guilt-ridden for giving the order to assassinate his son at which moment the chief minister brought him out of out of secret in krishna devaraya was declared his heir and successor the minister delayed proclaiming him till he had secured the loyalty of the local chiefs and feudatories which was soon obtained veera narsimha is said as per durjati that he died of vexation and anguish on his step brother being acknowledged as a king after years of fooling everyone of his death this story of durjati is apparently an echo of an attempt that appears to have been made on krishna deva raya's life by veera narsimha around the end of his rule and not narsanayaka so we will look at this in detail for now nunez who wrote within 25 years of the alleged attempt describes after local enquiries made by him at vijayanagara and narrates the following story before he died he sent for saluva timma his minister and commanded to be brought to him his son 8 years old and said to saluva timma that as soon as he was dead he must raise his son to the lion's throne of vijayanagara even though this child was not of an age for that and though the kingdom ought to perhaps belong to his step brother krishna raya and he tells salvatimma that he must put out the eyes of krishna raya and must bring them to him to show as a proof thus ensuring that after veera narsimha's death there should be no differences in the kingdom or civil war due to two power centers salvatimma agrees to obey veera narsimha's order and leaves the royal palace to fetch krishna raya he supposedly takes krishna raya to one of the royal stables in secret and reveals to him how his step brother and the emperor wanted his eyes to be plucked out and make his son instead the new ruler When Krishna Deva Raya hears this he is terrified understandably and tells Salavatimma that he really did not seek to be the new emperor not to be anything in the kingdom even though it should come to him by right the young Krishna Deva Raya or the Krishna Raya goes to an extent of saying that his real desire was to pass through this world as a yogi or an ascetic and that he should not put out his eyes as he didn't deserve that Salvatimma on hearing these words from the young Krishna Raya who was probably in his very early 20s decides that Krishna Raya should be the rightful king 
instead of the 8 year old child and son of Veera Narasimha Salvatimma at this point asks one of his aides to bring the eyes of a she goat and he presents it to the dying king Veera Narasimha as a proof of blinding Krishna Raya What for now Nanaises recorded chronicles about this chapter of Krishna Deva Raya's life reveal is truly fascinating as it gives us a glimpse into the mind of one of the most beloved figures of not just Vijayanagara but also of entire Indian history if one carefully looks at this supposed conversation between Salavatimma and the young Krishna Raya we can draw a few conclusions safely from it one Krishna Raya was understandably terrified to death at the prospect of being blinded and then being one step closer to being silently assassinated on the orders of his step brother who is on the death bed two krishna raya was trying to get out of his death warrant by hook or crook and he comes up with this dramatic reason of wanting to be or become an ascetic and that he was effectively abdicating his claims to the throne even though he was legitimately in line in short he was desperate to survive like anyone else three krishna raya probably meant every word of what he said to salavatimma this might sound far fetched considering the towering figure krishna deva raya was or is for us today and it might be inconceivable for us to think that krishna deva raya would have considered running away under the pretext of ascetism but this needn't be an implausible scenario if one looks into the life of krishna deva raya there is no real official biography of this great ruler that documents his early years his adulthood or what his life was like before he reached 20 or what he thought like or what exactly what kind of a man he was now one might ask why was all of this not recorded if he was such a great ruler I think there was no such dramatic conspiracy behind this. The most plausible explanation is very simple in reality. Early years of Krishna Raya was probably not considered really important or glorious enough to warrant the focus of either court historians or chroniclers back then. Just because Krishna Raya's mother came later in the royal picking order, her son too wasn't as important as the crown prince Veera Narasimha. so most focus probably was on the latter than the former and also there is a possibility that krishna raya himself was under some sort of a house arrest or put under limitations by veera narasimha to ensure that his younger step brother doesn't end up outshining him and also there is another possibility that krishna raya krishna raya might have spent his early years in leisure music wine and women which the court scribes and chroniclers later after he became the emperor might have chosen to sweep under the carpet as it wasn't glorious enough so th- that in a way might explain why we don't have enough recorded material on krishna deva raya's early years but then by looking at the 16th century ethno historical classic rai vachakamu we can draw some safe conclusions too by making some observations in it in one of the chapters it talks about the coronation of krishna deva raya and how he had to be extensively coached and trained by his council of ministers and especially by salavatimma on how to rule a kingdom or what a king should do or don't here krishna deva raya can be seen going through this rigorous training with both enthusiasm and frustration he is itching to rule and leave his unique mark as a ruler but then he's frustrated at his inability to break out of the box of limitations limitations as in the available choices for a rule or for his decisions so he's frustrated in a way you know of the box that he's put in it's a very new experience for him and something that he never expected nor was he prepared for by his father narsanayaka again i have to stress that this is my own inference and theory based on the recorded sources that are missing many crucial chapters of krishna raya's life 
but there can be hardly any doubt that both the poet Durjati and the Portuguese traveller Fernão Nunes refer to one and the same attempt on Krishnadeva Rai's life. The only difference being that Durjati attributes the attempt on Krishna Rai's life to his father Narsanayaka instead of his stepbrother Veera Narsimha. But we should take Fernão Nunes's chronicles as the more credible one. Considering the simple fact that Nunez was in Vijayanagara 25 years after this incident had happened and he obviously had easy access to the first hand eyewitness accounts whereas in the case of Durjati he was separated by almost 100 years after the attempt on Krishna Raya's life had taken place so the poet durjati might not have had access to fresh first hand information like fernao had and obvious mutations in the real story and its characters probably corrupted it fernao's chronicles are also backed up by certain other factors one of them being the inscriptional records of the time in which both krishna raya and veera narsimha appear as simultaneously ruling Now how would this have been possible It's important to recollect what I had earlier mentioned about Krishna Raya's father Narsanayaka The clue lies in his name He is always referred to as Nayaka and not a Raya Narsanayaka never officially crowned himself as the emperor even though he was the de facto emperor It might have been possible that Narsanayaka in his last years as his salva sovereigns were being dissolved rapidly in every sense ended up splitting the responsibility of administering the empire which is in the name of salva sovereign immadi narsimha so he split this responsibility to his both able sons from different wives who were veera narsimha and krishna raya this was probably done to avoid an immediate civil war between the brothers after he died and after the death of narsanayaka veera narsimha had the last salva ruler assassinated like we saw in the previous episodes and he effectively did a coup of the throne in a hasty manner if one thinks about it he might have had no other choice but to do this coup as veera narsimha might have been genuinely afraid of the possibility of a young and promising krishna raya either being seen as the most eligible one to take over the mantle from the dying saluvas or he might be the one who instead did the coup and effectively pulling the rug under the feet of veera narsimha it is very clear from recorded evidence that there was intense rivalry and jealousy between both the step brothers and krishna raya himself during his rule omits all mention of the period of a co-rule with his step brother veera narsimha but the version of nunes and these inscriptional records help us shed some light on it in the book further sources of vijayanagara history volume 1 by k nilakanta shastri he talks about how the account of fernao nunes is contradicted by rai vachakamu According to this work Veera Narsimha is supposed to have communicated one day to the assembled Dalanayakas on the captains or vassals that as he had become old they should make the necessary arrangements for crowning Krishna Raya as the new emperor he is also he is also said to have had handed over to Krishna Raya the official ring at an auspicious moment while Nilakanta Shastri doesn't completely rule out fernao nunez's account he does seem to consider the account of the ascension in rai vachakamu also as credible enough based on his assessment of the epigraphical evidence this evidence as per nilakanta shastri shows that krishna dev raya seems to have been on friendly terms with veera narsimha almost up to the end of the latter's reign as per shastri In several copper plate inscriptions of Veera Narsimha Krishna Raya and his mother Nagala Devi are referred to in respectful terms while neither Achyut Raya and Sri Ranga nor their mother Obamba is ever mentioned So 
As per him, this seems to be sufficient proof of existence of friendly relations between Veera Narasimha and his stepbrother Krishna Raya. Nilakanta Shastri, being the legend of a historian that he was, he didn't really give us any smoking gun clues to solve this ascension riddle as to how did Krishna Devaraya get onto the throne. And we can see that Nilakanta Shastri does not choose or pick one version. He doesn't pick either the Fernau Nanuiz's version as a smoking gun or as the theory of, you know, uh, Veera Narasimha and Krishna Raya sh- sharing a friendly relationship and that it, the transfer, power transfer was very smooth. So, so basically the confusion is left as is. By now, listeners would have realized that there is a clear confusion and controversy around the exact nature of ascension of Krishna Devaraya to the lion's throne. And with this, we shall end this episode, probably on a cliffhanger. In the next episode, we shall continue this fascinating story of Krishna Devaraya's ascension, unlock this puzzle and look at the immediate events after he sits on the throne. I sincerely hope the listeners enjoyed this episode. If you did, please hit the subscribe button and leave a rating and a review wherever it is that you're listening. A huge thank you for taking the time to listen to the show. I hope to see you soon in the next episode. Till then, this is Narendra Vikram, your host and narrator signing off. Hope you have a great week ahead.